Continuing on through the book of Genesis, I'll be reading today from chapter 11. And this morning, we're going to talk about the Tower of Babel. That's the way I say it anyway. Ken Ham says Babel. Something. It's a, a Bible story that I've heard ever since I was a wee little kid. And I'll tell you about some of my in, the impressions I had from that um, in a little bit. Be, be kind of humorous for you, I think, to, to know. Well, the book of Genesis is a book of beginnings. And one of the things that it gives us the origin of is languages. Have you ever wished that you could speak several languages? I have. I really, really would like to be able to learn to speak Spanish, and I probably could if I just put the time in on it. It's just that I don't put the time in on it. But I've got some willing people that would be helping me if I would do that around here, but it uh, hasn't happened yet, so I'm still, still needing to do that. But uh, there are thousands of languages and dialects in this world, and we often wonder where it comes from, and we often wonder when we hear the, the secular explanations for how languages came about. But this today is going to give us the true account of what happened that brought this about. <clears throat> so we are in chapter 11. I'm going to start off with verses 1 through 4. And as we go through this, I'm also hoping today that not only will we get this academic answer of where languages come from, but this, I believe this passage is, is important prophetically. That this has something to say to us in, the, in this day that we live in uh, that we should pay heed to. And I think that it signals a development and shows where we are uh, in, in relation to prophetic events in times and such as that. So begin verse 1, now the whole earth used the same language and the same words. It came about as they journeyed east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar and settled there. They said to one another, come, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. And they used brick for stone and they used tar for mortar. They said, come, let us build for ourselves a city and a tower whose top will reach into heaven and let us make for ourselves a name otherwise we'll be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth we are post flood probably a few generations down from Noah and his sons I tried to figure up as best I could what I thought the population of the world might be at this point because remember after the flood it got down to uh, only eight people uh, Noah, his wife, his three sons, and their wives. So by this time, uh, I think probably we're looking at 500 to maybe 1,500 people, and that is an absolute guess. I could be way off on that, but that's, that's kind of what I'm thinking uh, the population of the earth uh, could have been at the time. So... God had given this command to the people that he wanted them to spread out and repopulate the earth. But they did not do that. Most of them, anyway, did not do that. They, they stayed together as a group and they began to migrate. And they were kind of moving down out of the more mountainous area and they came to a, an area that was a large plain and that's where they settled. This this Shinar was in probably somewhere in or around today's Iraq, uh, close to Babylon. So the question, one of the first questions that we want to ask here is, why is it so bad that everybody stayed together? You know, that was a problem as far as God was concerned. And, you know, that seems like a strange thing for him to be upset about. So why, why would he be against that? Well, the first one is a just simply a logistical reason, and that is that God wanted the entire earth to be repopulated sooner rather than later. And, you know, if you remember that one of the main reasons why he created man was to administer and rule the earth. But if all the 
humans are staying in just one small part of the earth, then the rest of it goes completely uncared for. And so he wanted them to spread out. Now, I don't think that means he wanted uh, Noah's three sons to, to divide all over the world, you know, like Shem go to, to Israel and Japheth go to China and Ham go to Africa. I don't think it was so much of that. But uh, just they, they, he just wanted them to gradually spread out and to keep spreading out. Uh, kind of like the old saying that you used to hear from the pioneers that when you see the smoke from your neighbor's chimney, you're a little too close. And so that was kind of spreading out, but these people weren't doing that. So it was just a logistical reason. But another reason why he didn't want them to stay together was for moral reasons. All right, so there's strength in numbers, right? We all know that. We also know that humans were still wicked by nature and would rush to evil. Therefore, evil would increase at a greater rate if everyone stayed together. Now, that is probably just about as clear as Beaver Lake after the most recent flood. So let me explain. When, when Noah got out of the ark, and at one point after that, God gave him a covenant that he was never going to flood the, earth, the, the entire earth again. He's never going to destroy the entire earth and all of its inhabitants by water ever again. Now, he is going to destroy the earth sometime in the future by fire, but he's not going to destroy all life when he does that. Uh, he's going to make a new heavens and a new earth, and, and life is going to, to go on. But the, the, the covenant, the sign of this covenant that he made with Noah was a rainbow. Some, you ought to look this up sometime. There's some really interesting scientific uh, aspects to the fact that the rainbow finally appeared even after the flood. There weren't any rainbows before that. So God made this covenant with Noah and, and with us as well, never going to destroy the earth again by flooding. But what we've got to remember is that Noah, even though the Bible says that he was a righteous man, that he still had a sinful nature and he passed that down to his sons and his sons passed it down and so on and so what we have here is we still have a human race that's still sinful. A human race that is by nature wicked. And you know that the wickedness before the flood became very, very great to the point that uh, at one point Noah and presumably his family, they were the only people on earth that loved and served God. Every single other person on the entire earth uh, was against God, going against God, and you know he probably had to suffer some real persecution during those years that he and his sons were building the ark. Well, since nothing changed as far as the nature of humans go, then it would only be natural that the same processes that brought about the corruption of the earth the first time, that those things would also show up again, right? I mean, uh, Satan was still active, demons were still active, People were still corrupt. Uh, people still uh, ran from God. And even Noah's sons themselves, one of them, Ham, uh, was, showed himself to be quite the, the uh, wicked person. So, so, <coughs> so there's no reason to think that that, that that culture would not have just rushed to wickedness like the one before the flood did also. And that's where the strength in numbers comes in. People say, well, can't we accomplish more good working together than we can separately? Yes, we can. That's, we all know that, right? We can do a lot more good working together than we can separately. But have you ever considered the fact that we can also do more evil working together than we can separately? That's where gangs come from. So it just kind of depends on what the people want to do. If the people are inclined towards good, then working together is going to bring about greater good. If the people are inclined towards evil, then working together is going to bring about greater evil. All right, so here's two reasons to assume that those people, at, right after the flood, that they would work together for evil. First reason is by disregarding God's command to spread out. They were already showing rebelliousness. They already showed that. And then the second reason... Our culture has had many centuries of influence 
from Christianity, from Judeo-Christian values, from the law of God, and theirs did not have that history. And so today we see that even unbelievers, <coughs> excuse me, even unbelievers can do, quote, good things. That does not mean that they're good as far as God is concerned. Uh, it just means that it, as far as humanly speaking, you know, the Bible says that without faith it's impossible to please God. So if you're an unbeliever, I don't care how good of a work you do, it's not going to get you anywhere with God. But from our perspective, if a bunch of unbelievers got together and, you know, fed the hungry, that, that's, a, that's a good thing, right? That, that's a good thing. We're, I mean, I'd rather them do that than, than something different. But that happens because of all the influence of, of Christianity and, and Judaism down through the, the centuries has made an impact on the morality of our society, an impact, I would say, that is being lost fairly quickly. But they didn't have that influence. And so it, we should assume that these people, in, in staying together, were going to work together for evil. Why was it so bad that they wanted to build a tower? Was, did, did God just hate towers? Is, is he up there and going, ah, oh, they're building another one of those things. No, God doesn't just hate towers, although historically <coughs> towers represent human pride and independence from God. But even that is not the biggest issue. These towers had special religious, in other words, idolatrous purposes. Now, uh, when, I, when I was a kid, I, I had a, an interesting idea of these towers. These are some pictures, it's just going to go through quickly, of the basic ideas of what people think it could have looked like. Uh, the, the basic form is called a ziggurat, and this particular one right here was actually built in Yucatan, in Mexico. And so we see that this kind of thing was not just where they were, but it actually spread around the world. And the purpose of these towers, almost exclusively, was for pagan worship. So, see, when I was a kid in Sunday school, and, and uh, they, the teachers would tell us that they decided they were going to build a tower that would reach into heaven, here's what I pictured. I pictured heaven as being, well, the only thing that I knew of at the time that was heaven. That's where God's throne is and angels and <coughs> all the dead people that have gone on and such as that and on harps and clouds and things like that. But what I pictured was that they were going to build this tower that would go all the way up there. It's, you know, it's like, hey, we don't need God to come get us. We can just build a tower all the way up to heaven. We can just climb up there, maybe even take the elevator. Now... Even as a young child, I was pretty skeptical that they could build a tower that tall. But that wasn't it at all. There was, a, there was a belief at the time that up in the air, there were something kind of like what we might would call portals. Or think of <coughs> something like a stargate. They believed that there were places that were up in the air that were, were the physical and the spiritual intersected. And they were very highly interested in the occult, uh, in demonic worship. You know, anytime anybody ever worships an idol, there's a demon that's involved in that. Now, the people may not know that for sure and understand it. You know, they may really think that they're praying to that statue. Uh, but demonic activity is always behind idol worship. And so... Uh, they were very interested. They believed that if they could get this tower up high in the air, that they would reach a place where they could have a portal where the physical, the spiritual would intersect. And so they built that tower for those purposes. Now, do you understand why God was against the building of the tower? It was something that was greatly, greatly apart from God. All right, let's, let's go on with verse 5. <clears throat> The Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the sons of men had built. The Lord said, Behold, they are one people, and they all have the same language. And this is what they began to do. 
And now, nothing which they purpose to do will be impossible for them. Come, let us go down and there confuse their language so that they will not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from there over the face of the whole earth, <clears throat> and they stopped building the city. So that's where languages came from. God confused their languages, and because they couldn't understand each other, then <clears throat> those uh, family groups, presumably, that shared the same language, they went their separate ways. The name of the place was called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of the whole earth. Now, in the Babylonian language, the word Babel meant gate of God. So that gives you an understanding of what they were trying to accomplish. But there was a Hebrew word that sounded just like that, just like the word Babel, and it means confusion. And so the meaning of Babel down to us today means confusion because the Lord confused their languages. What does this have to do with us? I mean, we, we probably don't necessarily care that much where languages came from. I don't know about you, but I have an appreciation for a, an abundance of languages. Uh, there are some there are some languages that are beautiful languages, and uh, there are actually some languages that I think are not so beautiful. But, but there's something else in this, in this Bible story that is very relevant to us today. So let me just start by, by asking you, what do the terms globalism and new world order mean to you? What I'm going to try to show you today is that what we saw in, in post-flood Genesis is very, very much like what we are seeing today in this culture. As a matter of fact, I would go so far as to say that in a figurative way, the tower is being rebuilt. Being rebuilt. So globalism, what is it? It's the attempt to unite the world in a financial or business capacity, a religious capacity, a political entity is in a one world government, and, and many other perhaps uh, aspects to the attempt to unite the world. Now globalism is a very strong movement today. Politically speaking, the opposite of a globalist is a nationalist. Now I'm going to kind of get into that word here in just a minute, but the but right now, I think that of all the different conflicts in this country, you know, there's all kinds of opposite uh, ideologies in this country. You know, there's, there's the, the Democrat and there's the Republican, and there's the liberal and there's the conservative, and there's the religious and there's the secular, and that could go on and on. But this particular one, it seems to be um, really, really becoming more prominent uh, these days. And I think that one of the reasons why that it is becoming that way is the emergence of our current president. The reason I think that is because Obama was a globalist. In other words, he, he wanted globalists want to see the demise of the nation state in favor of of one world thing. They, they want governments to be less in power of themselves and they want the central world thing to be be more in control and Obama was almost exclusively a globalist and now since Trump has become president he is more of a nationalist and I really honestly believe that this is the reason why the media hate him so much. <clears throat> it's, they don't hate him because of his morals I mean, obviously, we all know that this president has had a lot of moral failures in his past. But that's not the reason why they hate him. You know, if you think about it, those people really, they could care less, couldn't care less about morals. Because you can see that in their own lives as well. Unless, of course, they can use it as a political weapon. They don't hate him because of his big mouth. And we all know that there's been many times that he has um, opened his mouth when he should have kept it closed a little while longer and thought about what he's going to say. We all know that sometimes those thumbs get carried away. 
So yeah, uh, there's a lot, there's some flaws in the character of this president, but none of those are the reason why the media, the entertainment, the elite hate him so much. It's, the reason is because he's, a, he's more of a nationalist. So a nationalist seeks to preserve the nation state, to, to protect it from the outside world, and to work as in a, a nation working towards its own good. And that's why that the people hate the phrase, make America great again, because that is not global. That's national. It's not a globalist saying, it's a nationalist saying. And because the, the elite in education and in media and in entertainment, because they tend to go much more strongly towards globalism, then this in itself makes a nationalist like Trump their enemy. Now here's something that you probably have picked up on. Y'all know what a white supremacist is, right? And we, we, we all, I'm sure, agree that that's kind of a despicable thing. That racism is, is totally unscriptural. It is totally against God's ways. And, uh, and so, so we, we understand that. But in the last few years, the media has taken this term nationalist and they have made it mean the same thing as white supremacist. And so you hear this word all the time, white nationalist. How many of you have heard that? You remember hearing that on the news, don't you? Really? Only one? That's what I thought. Yeah, you hear that, white nationalist. They should be saying white supremacist. Because a nationalist is not the same thing as a racist. But by, by, by bringing about the association of those two terms, then anybody who tends to be more nationalist in their view of government, in their view of how the world should be structured, automatically then people think racist. And so it's a war that's going on. A war between uh, the globalists and the nationalists and you can see by watching the news that it has erupted into violence on several occasions. And this is the basis for everything that's behind it. Now I've got to be really careful as a preacher because I feel strongly about some political issues but I've got to be really careful that if I'm going to bring up an issue in a sermon that the Bible has something to say about it. There are a lot of political hot buttons today that the Bible simply doesn't say anything to. A lot of things that Christianity does not address. And so I've got to be careful that I don't bring something up in a sermon unless there's something in the scripture that I can go to. On this one, I believe there is. Where does God stand on the issue of globalism? What does he think of that? Let me, let me get you this older term, and I'm sure that you're familiar with it, secular humanism. And that is the belief that all humanity should join together and work together to make our own heaven on earth apart from God. And when I say apart from God, that is an absolutely necessary part of their ideology. That's why it's called humanism and not theism. And this has been around for a long time. I know that most of you aren't going to be able to remember this far back, but when I was an eighth grader, it was the first year for Oakdale Junior High. It was Oakdale Junior High then, not middle school. And, um, and so I was, uh, I was one of the, the, the students that was in there the very first year that it opened. And when they started it, uh, they announced that this, the, this was going to have the humanistic approach, that this was an experiment with a new kind of school, and that it was going to take the humanistic approach. And I remember that we voted for most humanistic teacher, and, 
and most humanistic students, boy and a girl that were most humanistic, and we had absolutely no idea what that meant. And I'm thinking and looking back that most of the teachers and administrators didn't know it either. Because what we thought that meant, the humanistic approach, was that we could chew gum in class. It was the first time we had ever been allowed to chew gum in class. And so that's kind of the, the idea that we had. As, as the, the true nature of secular humanism became more known, then the administration of that particular school put a stop to that in a hurry. And so it, uh, that didn't really last very long. But, but the actual concept of humanism, like I said, the belief that all humanity should join together and work together to make our own heaven on earth. Doesn't that sound like the Tower of Babel? Make our own heaven on earth apart from God. Some people would say, well, doesn't God want us all to work together? Well, the truth of the matter is that God is working towards globalism. God is working towards world unity, but it's not going to happen until he himself is seated on the throne. Because no matter what you have, when you have imperfect people, you're going to have an imperfect world. So yes, God is working toward a perfect world, what we would call heaven on earth, it, way out there in the future sometime. But in order to have a perfect world, you must have perfect people. Right? In order to have a perfect world, you have to have perfect people. And that has not yet been completed. Because God has a, there, there, a special way, just one way possible to be able to accomplish that. You know what it is? It came about through the death of Jesus Christ and the salvation of those who trust him and as Charles said the regeneration of the new birth the changing of the human nature we we do still have a sinful nature but we have a new nature now and we are able to walk in the spirit and we are not obligated to sin anymore we have the power to overcome sin and, and we have something inside of us that is spurring us on towards godliness do you have something in you that, that just kind of tries to nudge you toward godliness? And If you're going against that, does your conscience ever bother you? And do you, things come into your mind like, I shouldn't have done that, or I shouldn't have said that, or I should have done that, or I should have said that. That is the work of God in you. It's either the Holy Spirit or your conscience, and usually both. Because the Holy Spirit can work through the conscience. So... Some people would say, well, you don't, have to have a, you don't have to have perfect people to have a good world. Just if you have good, good people, that's good enough. But is it? The, the problem here is that we have a tendency to think of ourselves as good just because that's the way we want to think of ourselves. The Bible tells us that nobody's good in their own nature. Nobody seeks after God. No, no, not one. They have all gone after other ways. We have all pursued sin. We have all become that. As a matter of fact, did you know that the Bible says that the best we can come up with in our own human strength you're going to see this in a second. He says all of us have become like one who is unclean and all our righteous deeds like a filthy garment. Let me just stop right there and tell you that the, the words filthy garment, uh, a great number of Hebrew scholars today are saying that most likely that Hebrew word referred to a minstrel rag. The best we can come up with all our righteous deeds are like that in God's sight, of what we do on our own. All of us wither like a leaf and our iniquities like the wind take us away. So is there a chance that secular humanism is going to be able to accomplish its goal 
of our working together to make a, uh, our own heaven on earth apart from God. Is there a chance of that happening? No. There is not a chance of that happening. And if you look around at, in, in history at some of the ideologies in the world that have really tried you know, and, and succeeded in getting their way, we, we see that that's true because is that not what communism was about? Communism about, uh, about making our own perfect world, our own heaven on earth apart from God. And you can look at the communist states and see they certainly think came a far cry short of that. You know, that's why that in communist countries that religion is basically illegal. That's why that they mandate evolution is because they're operating according to doing something that is apart from God. And so the goal of the state is to remove people's faith in God. They want to have a, a more, can I say this, humanistic approach in that they want in, in society for the people themselves to be gods with the principal deity being the state. And what we have seen happen in that is not heaven on earth, but something else entirely. Did you know that Stalin was responsible for way more deaths than Hitler was? And so, uh, so these things that we see going on today, we, and, and, and in globalism, you will find that the most common ideologies in globalism are communism and socialism. Those two things are very, very strong in those. And so what we need to do as we look at the world and as we form our own thinking is to see that some of these movements, some of these ideologies are going to lead us astray and that they're going to bring about a downfall of a lot of things that we hold dear. Now, it is true that sometime in the future, but before Christ takes the throne, that Satan is going to accomplish what he's been trying to accomplish all these millennia, and that is to form a one world government with himself at the top. That is going to happen. The Bible predicts that. The Bible tells us that that is the case. Thankfully, it's, it's not going to last very long. But the force behind globalism today is not God. The force behind globalism is Satan. And so what we want to do is we want to present the world a different answer. No, we are not going to make this world heaven on earth apart from God. We're not going to just work together and get better and better and better and better just on our own uh, through human effort and through goodwill of people and, and whatever, that's not going to happen. But there is a better way, and that is by trusting in Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of our sins, we become better people. We become different people. And as we become better people, then society becomes better. All of the most thought-out benefits of living in the time that we live in when it concerns human rights and things of that nature that's all come about because of the result of Christianity there's not been any other force that has that has worked towards equality like Christianity has if it wasn't for Christianity uh, it is very likely that slavery would still be an issue it is very likely that women still wouldn't have a right to vote. Uh, and many of the other things that we consider to be civil rights, those things are in place because Christianity influenced the world. The Bible tells us clearly that in God's eyes there's neither male nor female as far as one being greater than the other one. And so if we can somehow not only believe it ourselves but also to proclaim to the world that Jesus is the way to accomplish these things. Jesus is the way to make this world better. Jesus is the way 
to improve our culture. Jesus is the way to improve our lives. Then I believe that we're carrying out the spirit of what God wants to happen in this world.